Hey everybody. Thanks so much. Hey guys. Thank you all so much for being here. Like I said, I really, I really think this might be our biggest stereo session yet. Um, not a surprise. We're all really, really excited about this record. Um, I'm about to hand it over to JB in a few moments. But beforehand, I just want to say a few announcements. First of all, thank you so much to our sponsors tonight for making this possible. Thank you, Duncan Williams, for all the drinks tonight. Drinks around Duncan Williams. We um, will have the bar open until about 7.15. I think uh, by the time we get to side B, we'll be closing it down. So if you want a drink, go grab it. Um, we'll be closing down around then. Um, also, Duncan, I mean, sorry, Duncan Williams, we've already thanked. Thank you, <laughs> Dillard Door, another D. Um, thank you so much, Dillard Door, uh, for all of your support. We really appreciate you guys. Um, and also, our season sponsors, thank you, Memphis Listening Lab, of course, for allowing us to host these great stereo sessions in your facility. Um, thank you, Mempho Presents. They are a presenting sponsor for stereo sessions. And uh, thank you, Crosstown Brewing Company um, and Via Productions. Thank you guys so much for all of your support. So, yes, we really, really appreciate you guys. Um, and then, of course, this is a free series, y'all. This is all free, um, and we want it to be. We want it to stay free for as long as possible. Um, but we would, of course, love any support you guys are willing to give tonight. We've got donation boxes. We've got QR codes. Um, we've got Ruth Grant in the back, of course, who has all of the amazing WYXR merch. Thank you, Ruth. So um, we would love your support. And um, without further ado... We'll get started. Thank you guys so much. This is JB Boyd. Thanks, JB. JB. What it do? <laughs> How are y'all doing? Y'all all right? Yeah. Another stereo session. This is number four of this season, right? Some new faces. Jill, what's up, Jill? I saw you walk in. Give it up for Jill, the the, the, the MVP of our uh, most recent. Pledge drive. We had a a competition. We didn't know what to call it, uh, and so you know I, I like to be literal. Sometimes I said it's a competition to see who can get the buckets and who can get the most bucks. And Jill did both of those things, so we gave her a trophy. Uh, the trophy is a golden microphone, but I originally wanted a golden bucks head, but uh, <laughs> apparently hunting season cleared them all out. <laughs> She did get a shirt. She did get a shirt. And uh, we have you once again for uh, WYXR Stereo Sessions presented by Minfo. And thanks again to all of our wonderful sponsors that Kate mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, I, I like to put some of these records into context because I, I, I pick a lot of them. Um, a lot of people who have followed our station uh, from its inception in 2020 know about the heritage of our station and where it came from. And I, I try to do the best I can when picking records to represent Memphis and the corners of Memphis music that people maybe don't explore enough uh, with reverence for genres, for types of people, but also reverence for the opportunity to sit and listen to a record the way that you would go and watch a film with others, whether it be family members or friends, but you can only have so many family members and friends to sit and listen to a record the way you would go and see The Little Mermaid. <laughs> uh, but to have people next to you who maybe haven't experienced it themselves as well. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it can be difficult sometimes uh, to look at some of the strange aspects of Memphis music. Uh, Kate asked the question last season, you know, why aren't there any women featured? And I thought, damn. I, <sighs> and I looked at my, I looked at, <laughs> I looked at my collection, I was like, I don't think that they recorded many women with the thought that they would have a long playing record, a concept record. Uh, these are records that, to me, are adjacent to a hot butter soul, where you would sit down and say, that's a record. Um, and unfortunately, I just couldn't point to too many records in my collection. I thought, okay, they meant to make a record and saw that a woman was at the front of it. So we had to get creative to tell those stories. Uh, but I say all that to say, one thing that isn't spoken enough in Memphis, when we talk about the genres that are important to the heritage of our people, 
and the expression that we live with is, and every time that I curse, I have to remind Shelby that we have to cut it out when we play it on air. I'm but <laughs> send it to Robbie, who's on vacation. That's why Robbie's not here. Shout out to Robbie. We don't talk about jazz nearly fucking enough. <laughs> jazz is so important to the music that we have here in Memphis. And our soul would not be our soul without jazz. And our blues would not be our blues without jazz. Enough so that some folks who play jazz just call it the blues when they come from this city. And WYXR would not be WYXR, 91.7 would not be 91.7 in this city without jazz. And I, wanna, I want to give reverence to uh, our history and our heritage. We are born of the jazz lover. And I want to make sure that people understand that uh, we are not an affront to that history and that heritage. Uh, we are a continuation of it. Uh, Chuck, I see you hanging out there. Shelby, I see you. Um, although we make room for so many different things, we have to make serious room for that heritage and to really talk about it and to really dig into it. And uh, I wouldn't be where I am right now in this seat without uh, Mr. Malvin Massey and his leadership. And, you know, I sat in the hotel room with Charles Lloyd probably six months ago when I brought an intern with me and she had absolutely no clue who we were sitting around to talk to or why. But that was important to me to bring her with me. She wasn't from Memphis, I'll say that. Uh, so that I could do what I can right now, a couple days from turning 30 to... You're young. <laughs> uh, to be a bridge uh, between this heritage and the people who matter the most to me, like a Charles Lloyd, like my cousin Andrew Love, uh, like, you know, many, many people who, they played, like really played, and really taught one another. And when I think about why Memphis music maybe isn't what a lot of us who care about this community the most wish it could be, I think about the people who cut each other's What's the word? What's the phrase? They were cut from a certain cloth. You know, steel sharpened steel, iron sharpened steel. Like these people work together to create this thing that we're sitting in and we're living in. And it only existed because they woke up and they practiced before school. And they went to school. And they respected their band director. And their band director helped them to get gigs after school. And they went to gigs after school. And they stayed up all night. And their parents went to Bill Street. And got them back to where they need to go. And then they played at church, and then their parents had a barbecue, and they played the barbecue. And, you know, it wasn't Spotify. And it wasn't Pandora. And, it, you know, it was, you know, sitting there with that sheet music and figure it out. And, you know, kids today, kids today, uh, they have uh, the advantage of all of the things at their fingertips. But so much of the communicating that a Booker T. Jones and Amari White did was through music in school and, and, and after school and before school and in church and this and that. And so only through music and through friendship could a record like Young Men from Memphis exist. And they could play those notes to each other even as adults living in other cities that made them feel at home in music. Am I making sense? Yes. Yes. This is my third vodka soda, so. <laughs> uh, but I couldn't tell those stories uh, very well. Uh, one, because I only come on the scene so long ago. Sorry, my parents only had me 30 years ago. <laughs> uh, but there are some folks who truly study jazz in this city who I thought could help. And uh, I'll shut up and I'll introduce them. Uh, Joe Restivo and John Bass.
Hey, I feel my moves, so yeah. I'll, uh, We're doing so, this. So, so if you need me to be still, just like... No, you, I, mean, I, I want you to feel comfortable. That's what I want. Um, <laughs> Dr. John Bass, uh, if you could introduce yourself to my friends here. <laughs> Thanks. No, I appreciate you having, having me here, JB. And I really appreciate being able to talk about this record and sort of Memphis jazz in general. Um, my name is John Bass. I work at Rhodes College. I'm um, associate professor there. I'm the director of the Mike Curb Institute for Music. I've been in Memphis since 2000. Um, I moved here. Um, I grew up in Mobile, Alabama. I went to school in Mississippi and, and moved here in 2000 grew up in grad school, to go to grad school at the University of Memphis. Uh, I thought I was going to learn how to play guitar a little bit and stay here for two years and then go somewhere else. Uh, 23 years later, uh, I'm still here, and thankfully so. Um, and, uh, yeah, one, one of the things that sort of just framed the, the, tonight that, that's important to me is um, when, when I got here, I thought I was coming here to learn how to play guitar, and that was, you know, that was the main thing. What I quickly learned is that playing jazz in the city meant that not only did you have to sort of master your craft and know the songs, that was a given, but you also had to understand what it meant to play jazz here. And that's something that I learned from other musicians I played with, from people I met. Um, many of them are in the audience tonight. And so, um, yeah, I'm just happy to share some of the stories and some of the things that I've learned along the way. Awesome. awesome. Give it up for them, y'all. I don't want to talk about myself too much, but I'm a local guitarist. My name is Joe Restivo, and uh, I do a show here at WYXR on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. called Let's Get Lost. And uh, I'm really excited about this record because uh, I think there's a lot to say about it. And I think it's under the surface of this record, there's a lot going on. Uh, and hopefully, you know, I don't think we're going to get into all the, 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 the layers of this record. But I hope we get into a few, because I think it's very interesting. I think all the people in this record are fascinating. And uh, I think how the record, I'm very curious. And hopefully there might even be some people here who could answer these questions, because I'm very curious about how this record got made. Yeah, me too. Like, how did this, like, records get made, they're businesses, and someone has an idea, and there's a process. And I'm curious what that process is, and I don't really know, because we... I don't know if Mike Kelly's here, but uh, I tried to get Mike to ask George Coleman who plays tenor saxophone on this record, and George was like, no idea, don't remember it. <laughs> I mean, you know, this was a long time ago, and he's played on a lot of records. So anyway, I'm hoping we can kind of mix it up a little bit, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to have to mix it up, going to have to improvise. I mean, this is probably the first stereo session that we've had where someone isn't present that participated in the record in some way. Yeah. Or, has some, you know, intimate connection to how it was created, but it also is, by a long shot, the, the oldest record that we've done, 1959, mm -hmm. uh, which in a lot of ways predates even sort of Memphis as a as a, 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 a place that is well, we had some, super, super recorded. Well, was doing it, for sure, but, sure. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. but uh, Stax hadn't become yeah. Stax yet. Understood. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> so let's jump in into this record. You talk about the people. Well, first of all, can we talk about jazz itself and, and what it means to Memphis because it's it's not spoken of enough. Um, so, yeah, the, that was again when I when I moved here, that was the the thing that blew me away is just in Memphis music in general and jazz especially those those no way moments like no way that that person's from here no way that that was made here. Like, I, I, I've been here 23 years. <laughs> you know, I've learned as much as I can about it. I try to teach it a little bit, but I still am blown away by what I learned about what, what, what's come from here. Um, and the Memphis jazz tradition especially, this, um, uh, the, the players on this record, some of the players here, were some of the first that, that I, I didn't know when I moved here that they were from here. George Coleman, I didn't know. I didn't know Charles Lloyd was from here. Um, I didn't know Mulgrew Miller was from here. These people that I listen to all the time um, and just seen more and more. Um, but then when you um, uh, sort of dig into it a little bit more and, 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 and back it up, in the 1920s, there's a guy named Jimmy Lunsford 
Um, he goes to Fisk. He gets a job at Manassas High School, um, which is the African American high school from the north part of Memphis. So Booker T. Washington um, um, is for the south side, and, and Manassas is for the north. And he gets a job teaching English and coaching football. Uh, he's a musician, and uh, this is the 1920s, and so. Louis Armstrong is making his first records, the first really widespread commercial records, like the, you know, this is the first sort of pop recorded music. And he falls in love with it, he comes here, his students are crazy about it too, so he forms a band here. That band um, uh, uh, does all kinds of things in, in town. He goes on to become one of the very important, very famous band leaders, sort of the time of Count Basie and Duke Ellington. Um, uh, he's, he's running a band with some, some people from Memphis. Going back, though, you can dig into this a lot. We, we, can, we can talk about the history of Memphis jazz. Uh, don't, you, can, you can get me started, and I'll spend way more time than we have here tonight. But the thing that's interesting to me is that he, in the 1920s, in 27, 28, he's teaching jazz as a part of his music curriculum. Jazz is popular music. Jazz is like the devil's music at this period. You know, this is the music that parents do not want their kids to listen to, right? He builds this curriculum around this music um, and uh, sets this, you know, sets the stage for this to happen. And he's arguably the first jazz educator in the world. There's another guy in Germany that's sort of doing it at the same time, but I, I'll give the tie to Jimmy Lunsford on that. Um, you know, so he's the first jazz educator in the world is in Manassas buried High School. Buried at Elmwood. Right, yeah, buried at Elmwood, buried, yeah. 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 So, so it goes, it goes it, and, it's, and it's tied to education, which you were talking about earlier. It, it's, it, it's infused into the ethos. I mean, like, that would have been like constructing a, a curriculum around NWA and then, 80s and 90s, right? It would be that shocking of music to construct your curriculum around, right? Um, but, you know, that's what happened, and it sets forward this sort of tradition that goes, and it's in Manassas High School in the 1950s, which is where George Coleman goes, and Booker Little, and Harold Mayburn, and Charles Lloyd, and so many other, and Isaac Hayes goes there uh, several years later. So it starts this sort of tradition of there. Um, and so it's... Um, and, and from the very beginning, if you want to talk about the very beginning, Lil Harden Armstrong is Lil Harden is from Memphis, and so not only was she L Louis Armstrong's wife, um, and a big part of the business there, but she wrote a lot of those songs, right? And so what I always tell my students is that jazz wouldn't exist without the creative contribution of a woman from Memphis, Tennessee. So um, you know, just going all the way back. We can talk about Memphis from the very beginning, and then it just it just sort of goes from there. So piggybacking on that, well, and wanted to mention also Mary Lou Williams lived here briefly in the nineteen forties. She's one of the greatest jazz pianists that ever Absolutely. lived. Period in New York, but she she did spend time in Memphis. I want to, if we can, I know we want to get to the record. Can we get? Can we talk about some of the players here? Uh, as they say in church, take your time. Okay. Down. <laughs> so we have, I think. I think Booker Little is, is the person maybe first we can, I mean, I'm not going to do a bio on each one of these individuals, there's a lot of musicians on this record, but he's one of the, he's a catalyst. Take your time, take your time, it's all good. Tell him you're calling back. He is an important catalyst on the trumpet, he is a conduit from, uh, from the revelation of, of, of um, Clever Brown uh, to to Freddie Hubbard, in my opinion, um, he's he's the guy that gets you there. He was uh, on his way to becoming a titan, and he was cut short. He died in 1961. This is this is cut in '58. So this guy's 23. a baby, and he's playing way ahead of his. He's on the very cutting edge of what jazz is doing, and what that means is. We're taking the language of the blues. We're taking the language of folk music. We're now we're introducing Bartok, Stravinsky. We're introducing 20th century classical music because he went to the University of Chicago. Okay, he goes to Chicago and his buddies follow him up there. These guys are like brilliant men. These are kids really, they're on the forefront. But there's and when you hear the record, you're going to hear some of this chromaticism on the top. And I'm not going to have a theory lesson here, but. When we listen to the first track, which is a blues, 
when you hear Booker's opening statement, he's playing a very dissonant phrase, and it works because he's funky and he's from Memphis, but he's also playing very advanced harmonic material. So that's, that's Booker. George Coleman, the baddest dude, saxophone player in Memphis. He was originally on alto. He was the guy that when somebody came through Bill Street, they would go, go get George to cut him, whoever, whoever it was, whoever was in the Basie band, whoever was the hot, everybody came through Memphis. George was our, the baddest dude in town and he would come get you, okay? And so he goes on, and he's still with us. And he's, he's led, a, Miles Davis, he's, go look, check his records out. It's an incredible story in history. Then we get next this very unusual person playing alto saxophone, and I would make a case it might even be his record because he seems featured on it, even though one cut is just piano, it's just the rhythm section. And we'll talk about that. But he uh, he's white, which is interesting, and he also ends up disappearing. He's still alive. No one has talked to this man, and maybe there's some of you who know but Frank Strozer is still with us, but uh, he just sort of makes this incredible statement, and he's making records in the 70s, and he's coming to Memphis, and he's, but then he's gone. Okay, so I think I find that fascinating. Then we get the, the Newborn Brothers, the great, the genius, the, one of the greatest geniuses that we've ever produced, Phineas Newborn, or Finus, but he didn't like to be called Finus because the girls would call him Fine Ass. So he said Fin he wanted to be called Phineas. I wouldn't mind being called that. I was about to say. <laughs> it seems like they're, they're worse things. Win win. <laughs> it's John Bass, there are worse things. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. I've heard, I've heard, you can I've borrow heard, JB I've, if I've you heard, leave. I've heard a lot of them. <laughs> we could we could have an entire symposium on this man. We could have that on a symposium with any of these people, actually. Then we get his brother Calvin, who's like this, he's like this jump blues, raw guitar player who got to New York and studied with Barry Galbraith and really got his bebop and his language together. And that's the guy who I was a hero. I'm a guitar player too. So that was my hero coming up in the 90s watching him. Then we get um, Jameel Nasser, uh, George Joyner, and the Joyner family. He's a bass player is part of this legacy family. He ends up becoming, converting to Islam, going by Jameel Nasser. His son is a great alto saxophone player still working in New York. He's a whole uh, thing. Charles Crosby, I don't know a lot about the drummer. He's kind of the most unknown character. If anyone is familiar with Charles's work, he didn't seem to make a lot of records. But that's the layout. These are, uh, um, these are a group of individuals coming together and the last thing I'll say, before, you know, uh, is is this record a blowing date or is this record more of an organized um, session? Because I contend it's both. Um, the first cut is very organized. It's very chromatic. There's, it's a blues, but it's very dissonant, and I want you to take note of that. Then we'll listen to side A. The second song on side A is a very blowing session. It's a song that was a Dizzy Gillespie blues. It would be something like, hey, we all know that. Let's just do it. It wasn't very worked out. It doesn't feel that way. It feels very loose. First cut's not that way. It's very organized, very dissonant. And then we'll talk about side B, but I just wanted to kind of throw those few points out. All right, I've learned. I don't know if y'all have y'all learned. <laughs> uh, I think it's probably time to, to listen to the record. I was gonna ask if you could help me explain that. Yeah, sure. Just <laughs> last time I messed it up. <laughs> All right, so when you came in the door, excuse me, you got an A or an, a B card. Um, if you have the A card, that means that you can actually go into the listening room over here for side A and listen to side A in this man magnificent room. And then if you have a B card, you will listen to side B in the listening room. So all the side A can go ahead and move on into the listening room right now. Thanks, y'all. What? I hope they didn't get paid by the cut for this record. You know? so I, they, I, mean, right. I think they got paid for the day. Not by the, uh, yeah, I think they got paid. I'm assuming like a union musician, you get paid for the session. Yeah. Or by the hour, I guess. I think that I underestimated how great jazz would sound in this city. Oh, it sounds fantastic. It's a great, I know, it's great sound. Are these um, Eccleston no. speakers? What are speakers are these? I know those are. Yeah, they are. They are. They sound they are. fantastic. Whole, whole, uh, whole room is bespoke. I do want to say how great the record sounds, and so the kudos to the engineers who made this record, because I was telling 
uh, John that one of the problems with a lot of these early records, in my opinion, a lot of these mid-century jazz records, is they kind of miss on the bass a lot of times. The bass will be flabby or just kind of non-present. Even, even Rudy Van Gelder sometimes had a bad day. But the bass on this record sounds phenomenal. I mean, excellent. I mean, and the player has a lot to do with it, but... And I think that uh, the message might have gotten out that when we begin side B, they're going to start breaking down the bar outside. So if you got, <laughs> got an empty seat next to you, that may be why. Would you repeat that announcement? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think you, you, I think you got the message. <laughs> it was for you specifically. All right. Enjoy it. Well, uh, you know, I say that because I don't see David Less in here. If, who got to hear the record in that room there, the, the state of the art room? Uh, I want to make sure I have a special thanks for uh, David Less who donated his Japanese copy of the record uh, so that we'd have an extra one. You know, that's another thing that goes into picking these records is which ones can I get two copies of <laughs> very quickly? Uh, if I have one and I have to find a friend that has another. Uh, Anything st stand out to y'all about that first side? Um, about the, when you when you listen to the record, I mean the, the playing on it is 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 amazing. With the the it, it, it's, as Joe was talking about earlier, when when Booker comes in for, on that on um, things like the way they used to be, that first chorus, I mean it, it it it's it's another you're in a different space, right? We've gone into a different area with that. Um, and everything he everything he recorded was like that. Um, uh, one side note that I do want to mention about Booker Little, um, about about his family in general, um, uh, it sort of underscores sort of the the genius and sort of the the music education that was going on at the time. His older sister Vera was an opera singer, um, and um, so uh, she was uh, she got a, a Fulbright, went to Paris and studied. Um, and she was actually, and I, I had to look this back up, um, uh, she was the first, uh, um, uh, on April 4th of 1959, which is the same year this album was released, uh, she was the first um, uh, black performer to sing for the Pope, period. Um, so the first singer, the first uh, African American singer to sing for the Pope was a, a woman from Memphis, Tennessee as well. And that's Booker Little's older sister. Um, happened the same year. Um, and the other, the other thing is just the, the, which I really appreciated, which Joe and I talked about a little bit too, is the interplay between Calvin and Phineas Newborn on this. Um, uh, it, it's, it's rare to hear them on a date. It, the only ones I know were, were Phineas's dates, um, where they're, it's his record, but to hear them both kind of in an accompaniment role to somebody, they're having a whole different conversation. It's it's like it's like you're in the, it's like you're at a party, right? And they're the people that are having the conversation themselves, but they're still in the conversation with everybody else. You know, they're just sort of going in between, and that's what that reminds me. But it's really it's really remarkable. Yeah, piggyback on that. It, it, it's it, it, there's a layer of a soloist that you're hearing because I know not everybody in here is is familiar with this music, and I know for a lot of people that you know because I listen and play all kinds of music, but People are like, I just don't understand it. Don't understand. Like my, I got a good guy who works on my guitar. He says, I don't understand it. But there's, it's, it's kind of a thing where you, for me, it's like when I first heard this music, I didn't understand it at all. But it moved me. And there was these layers. There's, there's, a, there's a soloist happening, and that's probably mostly when you're first listening to this music that you're hearing the soloist. But there's like, like Dr. Bass said, underneath that. There's a whole conversation going on, and Calvin and, and, and Phineas are having that, and we were talking about it because we're both guitar players, and one thing you learn as a, when you're a guitar player is like, don't comp where the piano player is. I've been literally yelled at for that. Don't comp. If one of you do it, you do it, or you do it. Pick one. But they're, doing, they're playing together, and it's like a whole orchestral thing happening, and it's not written out. It's happening... <clears throat> in immediate time. It's being improvised, and that's why this music's so special. I also wanted to say really quickly, because you know, I could blabber on and on, but the trumpets, because if you're, if you're listening to side A, and for people who listen to side B, you didn't hear any trumpet. Uh, if, if, if uh, everyone mistaken, heard side A in you heard, both side rooms. Side A, side A. Okay, great. Okay, I was yeah. confused about that. Awesome. So when we're going to listen to side B, 
we're not we're going to hear a kind of a different ensemble. We're going to hear just the rhythm section play after hours, and then we're going to hear Frank Strozier feature on Star Eyes. But so I want to make a point just about Booker Little. Most of the first, both of the first cuts on side A, the first trumpet solo is Booker. The second trumpet solo is Lewis Smith, who I didn't mention. And Lewis Smith is an amazing musician, was a great educator for many, many years. But you're listening to uh, uh, Lewis, who comes in second or after Booker, which I would do that too, good choice, <laughs> is playing a language rooted in the bebop era, uh, the previous era. He's listening, he's coming from the Dizzy Gillespie school or the Clifford Brown school. Booker's on a, doing something else. Yeah. I'm doing this now. Yeah. We're not doing that, I'm doing this. And, and we're talking about a, a 19, 20 year old, 21 year old. And he's playing the trumpet, these high registers, <coughs> these huge, and then down low, up, down, like that's, I'm not a trumpet player, but I have friends who are. It's a brutal instrument on your face. It's, it's <laughs> damaging to your, it's, I mean, I have trumpet players turn around like, oh, ugh, just look at me like, ugh, this thing, you know? The fact that he's doing it with that much ease is, Unbelievable. It really is. It just floors me every time. Anyway. Uh, I mentioned a little bit of my theory uh, for picking this record. And shamelessly, I'll say, if we're going to talk about Memphis and jazz, uh, it, we could cover the spread because almost everyone's here. And so I thought, if we're going to talk about Memphis and we're going to talk about jazz, we might as well talk about the record that has tons of art. Rather than pick one from one artist, one, this, everyone... There's an ensemble. We'll get to talk about a lot of their stories. We'll get to hear a lot of them play, uh, and we'll get to hear the rare moment where they got to play together. Uh, but not everyone is here, and a lot has happened since. You mentioned Mulgrew Mer Miller. You have mentioned, uh, I mean, it was not mentioned, Kirk Whalum, who is a world-class musician. Uh, but also, Charles Lloyd is not here on this record. Uh, and there are some other folks who deserve mention. Since we're talking about everybody and how Memphis has given so much to soul and rock and roll and to blues, and now, hip hop. Uh, but what has it done in jazz and some spaces that we won't, get a, won't be able to talk about uh, if we only talk about the people who are present for this recording? Um. Yeah, I mean it's 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 vast. It's huge. There's um, you know more people that are not on this record that are that are crucial than we can we can sit here and name. Um, uh, but uh, two of them uh, did come from uh, uh, Manassas High School, and there was if you want to, if you want to know more about this, there's a period right there in the 1950s um, where uh, there's a group of young people who are in school together. Uh, their band director is a guy named Matt Garrett, um, who was Dee Dee Bridgewater's father, mm -hmm. um, was the band director at the school uh, during this time. Uh, uh, Charles Lloyd uh, transferred from Melrose to go to Manassas to study with him. Um, and so there's this really unique period. And the, the, the frame I like to give my students is that there's, there's a lot happening in Memphis at this time. This is in the mid-50s, right? So this is, uh, this is when Elvis and Jerry Lee Lewis and Carl Perkins are all over at Sun Studio doing what will become, um, you know, uh, the, the the very beginnings of what comes out of Sun Studio. At the same time, there's a group of young people around the same age at Manassas High School who are, you know, going through some of the most intensive music education that that you can have. Matt Garrett is 23 when he starts working there. He, I, I got to talk to him about 10 years ago, and he said he was. They were pretty much peers, right? They were playing gigs together. They were going to the plantation and playing every night, going back to school, playing, getting out of lunch, playing. That was just, this, it was all infused into that. And the other thing that you need to notice, all these people, except George Coleman, I, did, uh, I don't think did, but everybody else went on to study music at a higher education um, uh, in a lot of really great places, too. So these are really highly educated musicians, and this was part of the ethos of the music and of the jazz musicians at the time. And so I think that's a really important step. At the same time, everything's going on at Sun. There's a group of, of African-American musicians who are studying to go to New York and change jazz forever. Well, well, and to piggyback on that is, if one thing that you take away from this is education creates industry. It creates commerce. I mean, if you want to look at it in a materialistic framework, 
these programs give you stacks. They give you high records. They give you those musicians. And how do I know that? Because I've played with a lot of them. And musicians that come from that specific period have a very high degree and a high level that you have to meet. And I learned that pretty young because I wasn't meeting it. <laughs> I wasn't meeting it at all. They were like, okay, oh, you want to get on sta stage with me? You want to be on my bandstand? Well, guess what? This is, what you, this is how it goes. This is the level that you have to perform at. And that means knowing how to play your instrument, knowing how to play in tune, knowing how to arrange, knowing how to... Um, uh, improvise over a complex set of chord changes, being able to play funky. You gotta play funky, you gotta play soul, you gotta play groovy, but you also gotta be able to, to articulate uh, a certain linguistic realization of this music and the blues, of course. Um, whether, the, you know, I had the opportunity of, of um, working with a great organ player named Charlie Wood that had a regular gig on Bill Street and he had Calvin Newborn in the band who's on this record and I would get to sub for Calvin, and sometimes I'd go to the gig and it would be like Fat Sonny or Mickey Gregory or Noki Taylor or Pug Dandridge or Jeff Grayer behind the drums, and they would kick my butt. They would kick my ass up and down the bandstand because their ears were better than mine, their, their, their linguistic knowledge was better than mine because they went to these schools and that's the way it was. You either hang or you don't. And um, so that's the level that you get to, you take that kind of player and you get them to Chicago Conservatory, then you get them in Max Roach's band like Booker Little and George Coleman, or you, Max Roach ain't messing around. I mean, that's the creme de la creme, that's the best. And that's how you get a 20 something year old on this level that quickly. Schools. If I could give a shout out to uh, Memphis, Memphis Jazz Workshop that is uh, working tirelessly to, to replicate a lot of the success uh, with, with Memphis, young people in Memphis, to learn. You know, you point it to, you're in the, you're in the jazz workshop? Stand up and yeah. let it go. Yeah. Young saxophonist right here. Uh, I also want to shout out Paul from Audio Mania, who I used to have a lot of conversations like this with. Uh, whenever I think of stereo sessions, I think of the people who sold me a lot of these records and told me what to look for and taught me how to appreciate music through liner notes and learning the names of the people who were in the room. Uh, you know, I also wanted to talk about some of the things that don't happen on record because, you know, you mentioned the Plantation Inn and, and Bill Street and, you know, there was a Phineas Newborn Sr. and a Louis Seinberg Sr. And uh, and Al uh, and excuse me, and Al Jackson Senior, and many of these elder musicians who uh, laid a lot of the groundwork uh, and created a fertile soil for soul to exist and rock and roll to exist in this element. Sunbeam Mitchell. Sunbeam Mitchell. And what? No one talks about Sunbeam Mitchell. If without Sunbeam Mitchell, we might not have George Coleman because I think he was. What I understand, he was living in that ho his hotel and like coming up on it, you know, giving him a place to stay, giving him an opportunity to to play. Uh, Sun B. Mitchell was a was a black business owner on, and would also put on parties. You could go, he could take young musicians, get you a gig, give you a place to stay, give you an opportunity. You know, how many? I mean, how many musicians we wouldn't have if it for him? He got he's got a, a Bill Street brass thing so there's some recognition but I don't think enough so. well as a young listener uh, sort of coming through these records there's a moment there where soul and rock and roll and rockabilly and country and jazz and blues and R and rhythm and blues are phrasing things in a similar way I feel um, when you think of Bill Black's combo and Ace Cannon and what Willie Mitchell was doing, and uh, what Booker T and the MGs were doing, and what many people were, were, were expressing as a Memphis sound uh, that I think when you talk about commerce and marketing and how to tell people what to expect from a record, they were doing a lot of similar things. Uh, and I think an untrained ear might just say, all, all that's jazz. 
Uh, but someone else might say that's soul, that's rock and roll, that's blues, and that's country. Uh, well, some of these guys are going through the. Well, some of these guys are going through the BB King organization. Yeah, a lot of the, a lot of people on this record were on his on his first albums. Yeah, so uh, the, the, you go through the through rhythm and blues. That's how you start playing. That's how you kind of start figuring out what you're doing. Get on a bandstand. Kind of start getting used to just being on a bandstand. So I mean, you know, you might not have all the language we're hearing here yet. But you're, you know, some of these guys, they're 16, 17, playing on these professional organizations, you know, where you had to show up and wear a suit. And yeah, I'll, never, I'll never forget, uh, one of the, my favorite things that Charles Lloyd told me was, he, he said, if you couldn't play a polka, you couldn't work in the 50s. <laughs> and so that's, you know, that's what Charles Lloyd said. It's like, you, you've got to be able to do whatever the situation brings, right? You know, and so yeah. that gave them sort of the flexibility to, you know, go in, in, in between areas. Well, is it is it genre or is it people? Because it sounds like a lot of these bands play tequila. Um, but also, you know, Alfred Brown told me a couple, you know, a few weeks ago that after hours, which is on this record, was in contention for being the Black National Anthem before we had a Black National Anthem. Right. Um, so what is a standard and, and, and what is a genre and, and what is the Memphis sound if, if Al Jackson Sr. and, you know, Bill Justice are playing the same music? I don't know the answer, but I will say this. Genres come from industry. They come from labels because they have to sell product. And young musicians are not thinking that way. I mean, they're just not. They're playing together, they're interacting, they're having fun, they're trying to make a dollar, maybe trying to meet some girls, whatever. And then some guys, well, you want to make a record? Well, we got to call it this. You know, they, 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 they're, they're here, they're playing with BB, and then they hear Charlie Parker, and they, like, they flip the fuck out. <laughs> because if you're, if you're playing the blues and you're, like, getting it together, and then you hear Charlie Parker, you're like, oh, Okay, well, all right, I want to do that. And so you make a choice, and then somebody goes, well, you're not doing, you're doing this, or, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it, I don't think there are, t these guys are thinking in that context. They're artists, they're thinking from an artistic vantage point rather than a, than a commercial or materialist one. So, are that the, makes any sense. Are the marquee sold, are the barquets rock and roll? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what, when you talk to it's Charles. All, well, I was going to say, I think, I don't know if you all familiar with Nicholas Payton, but I think he's done the best with this. Nicholas Payton's a great jazz musician, incredible jazz trumpet player and composer in New Orleans. He calls it, bam, black American music. That's gospel, jazz, blues, R&B, hip hop. It's all, it's all, and he does it all, funk. He does it all. When you hear him, he incorporates all that music. And... That's what I would. And when you, when you talk to Charles, right? He just he just calls himself a blues man, blues. right? You know, and so he's probably he's playing all this out stuff, right? He said, "I'm just playing the blues," you know. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, you know, with soul, which is so prescient to the way that we talk about music in this region today, and how important horn work is to that music. Uh, how do we contextualize soul as is it is it a, 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 a child of, of jazz? Is it a grandchild? Is it uh, a distant cousin? Uh, when you think of someone, as you mentioned, uh, someone who is learned in a way, and Joe, I know you and I have talked specifically about this person, and we'll put a pin in it for later on. Uh, but Booker T. Jones, uh, who came in uh, to his first session at Stacks as a trombone player uh, on Because I Love You with uh, Rufus and Carla Thomas. And someone like a Joe Arnold. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Andrew Love and Wayne Jackson. and uh, You know, the horn has meant so much to Memphis music. And if you just push it way out into its most dangerous and exciting and a most experimental place and you have someone like uh, a John Hassel who you know is, is important to world music and uh, work with Brian Eno and all that. I mean what does the horn mean to Memphis if it begins 
with the Civil War era and those bands and pushes all through fife and drum and through rhythm and blues and you got Charlie Chalmers at stack, I mean son, and all, just, I mean, this one instrument, and I think the organ deserves its, piano, its, its yeah. place, yeah, the piano and the organ, but yeah. what does the horn mean to defining this region? I'm trying to get to the root of something here. I think horn, all horn players are gonna look to, whether they, they probably come up in marching band, then they hear somebody that, whether it's Charlie Parker or Sonny Rollins, they hear a jazz musician that let, sets them off. Now they might end up in a, in a soul context. Uh, I don't know if y'all saw the James Brown documentary, but um, Pee Wee Ellis, I think it was Pee Wee Ellis, a saxophone player, he was like, man, we all wanted to play jazz. That's what we wanted to do. We thought this was kind of lame. Well, they, they thought this was just like, yeah, we're gonna do this until we all hit as the next. That's just, that's normal, because you're young and you want to be Michael Jordan. You want to be the baddest dude, you know, on the block. And the way you just demonstrate being the baddest dude on the block is you just heard it, playing like George Coleman or Booker Little your, or whoever you know who your hero is. But you got to you know got to make you got to put you know uh, 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 you got to make a living. So you end up in a soul band. That soul band might be the greatest thing that ever existed. It might be the James Brown organization or it might be Stacks or whatever. But Isaac Hayes, all those guys could play changes and play get went and played these kind of dates where they were playing, improvising. Uh, the Willie Mitchell Band, um, James Mitchell, Willie Mitchell. Mm -hmm. They all could, you, uh, Andrew Love, they could all improvise and they had some of this language. It might not be changing the world like Booker. Booker's on the front, you know, he's on the cutting edge. But that, that's, that's part of being Having that playing that instrument, guitar players, we're 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 we're, we're like Cro Magnet, man. We just want to bend notes and you know play the blues. Right. That's because we get house when we do that. Turn up, <laughs> it works. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer. It's something that's always been interesting to me is is um uh you know in soul with stacks, you know it it, it a, a record that y'all you know listen to uh, on this session, uh, Hot Buttered Soul, right? Isaac Hayes. Is a graduate from Manassas. When, when he starts to exert some more creative control over there, and things are just changing in general. And it's it's not that simple, of course, you know. But there's a profound difference, right? It's it, and it does seem to be more of a focus on, I, I, I it's a good jazzier. I don't know, but it like it, it does something. It makes a turn right there, right? When 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 somebody that came up in this tradition has a little bit more creative control there. And then that becomes a reference point for kind of what the 70s become in terms of sound. So that's, I'll defer to like the people who know way more than this, people at Rhodes who know way more than this than I do. Um, but that's just listening to it and understanding the history, that's just something I kind of hear in it. Uh, I want to move this IB uh, because we don't have all night, but I did want to give kudos to you know a modern family that I mentioned earlier is the Whalum family, uh, which Outside of just the ones that we know, there's Peanuts Whalem who played piano, um, and there are Whalems that did choral music. There are Whalems that have done other things, but of course, I just gig with Kenneth the Third, who is a very well-known saxophone player. Just played in Paris with Jay Z, um, and oh, Kenneth, Kenneth's killing I the man, the, the man. He got a new single out. Got a new single out, uh, and of course, Cameron who. Killed it. Former WXR DJ, but you know why he's not anymore? Because he's so busy. <laughs> Brought a hit home uh, with uh, Uptown Funk, Bruno Mars. Uh, plays within that collective of musicians. But uh, the man that we all truly know and love, Kirk Whalem as well, uh, discovered, in a sense, by Bob James. And uh, has you know played the solo on I'll Always Love You by Whitney Houston. And has carried this legacy of Memphis uh, into a new generation. So I, I don't want it to be uh, lost that uh, you know, definitely that family has been a bridge in keeping this tradition and moving it into a modern era. So, cool. Y'all cool with that? Cool. Anything else we miss? Just play some music, you say? Yeah, on side, on side, you get to hear side B, well, you want to yeah, do it? We, we want to tell you what the tracks, because we got, so the first side we heard Things Ain't What They Used To Be, that's a Duke Ellington composition, and then we heard Blue and Boogie, which is a Dizzy Gillespie composition, side B. Yeah, and then After Hours, which we talked about earlier, um, is a, this is a feature for uh, Phineas and Calvin, um, so this it's, it's, it's nice, and then they finish off with Star Eyes, which um, Stroger will play.
Yep. Let's do it. All right. Did y'all enjoy? This has certainly been one of the most. I thought the Grifter. I thought the Grifter's record last season was the most interesting of the stereo sessions. But most certainly, this has been one of the most interesting nights, and I have all of y'all to thank for that. Um, thank y'all so much for being here. We're going a little bit later than we typically do because of the cocktail party. Uh, but I want to thank Joe, thank John for all your expertise. Yeah. I want to thank y'all for hanging on. Uh, and I, you know, I'm really glad that this record exists. Uh, I think that David, David, you still here? You want to make your announcement? Uh, about the record? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're doing a new record uh, based on this record, but not really. <laughs> uh, we are doing a record with Memphis International Records, and it's kind of the uh, new young men from Memphis, uh, because jazz is still as good as it's ever been. It never went away, and it's never going away. So we decided with Johnny Phillips, who is a saint. Uh, it's a record company who told me if I can break even, he'll be happy. <laughs> So he gave me a budget, and we're hiring a national publicist, and we're making a record with kids from Memphis, college kids, young men. Kid, everybody, everybody in the room is a kid today. <laughs> but with young people from Memphis, young jazz players, real jazz players, we're making an honest to God jazz record. Um, with the drummers in high school, he'll be a, he'll be a, uh, um, a junior in high school. The trumpet player uh, it just finished his freshman year of college. Uh, they're 20, 21. The oldest guy, they're 25. Um, it's a quintet. And uh, we're going to make a jazz record. With, uh, one song will be for here from this record as an homage to this record. And the rest of them will be <coughs> some traditional jazz stuff and some Memphis stuff done in a jazz treatment. We'll do a Willie Mitchell song. We'll do Dark End of the Street. We'll do different things that are, it'll be a Memphis-based jazz record with young players. But don't call them young men because they're grown-ass players. <laughs> and they're gonna play, I mean, listen, Tony Williams was 17 years old when he played with Miles Davis. Miles Davis was 17 years old when he played with Charlie Parker. Uh, McCoy Tyner was 20 when he played with John Coltrane. The expectation is this is gonna be a grown-ass record. And so these guys are going to play records, going to play jazz, and it's going to be a, a great record. It's going to be young players from Memphis that are playing real jazz. And it's, a, it's kind of based on this. And we owe Johnny Phillips a real uh, tribute because I've never heard of a record done with Johnny Thank you, David. Thanks for lending your copy of the record so we can have one for each room. Uh, thanks for all of our sponsors. Uh, we are uh, a little bit remiss because this is the part of the program where I say I'll see you next stereo session. Uh, unfortunately, we've had to move the next stereo session a week. What's the date on the next stereo session? Well, stick close to your newsletter. If you aren't subscribed to WYXR newsletter, you'll you'll see the the new date. We hate. Well, we hate to print up press materials and then start changing things, that costs money. So you'd be <laughs> pretty darn certain that uh, if we have to move the date of a stereo session, there's a pretty good reason. And as you notice, Robbie isn't here tonight, so it's even more important than Robbie not being here. Ruth was here. Ruth was here. Ruth just celebrated her birthday. Happy birthday, belated Ruth. Um, if you want to know just how old Ruth is, her, her high school yearbook is on the bookshelf back there, so I'll, I'll leave you to it. You have to come back to the Memphis Listing Lab to go and find out which year Central High School Ruth graduated. Uh, Grant is not Grant is not her maiden name, so have fun with that. Um, lucky you, you didn't leave out early. I'm gonna make an announcement about why we had to uh, change this next year's session. It's a happy reason. Um, 
The Stax Music Academy is doing a concert in New York City uh, with Booker T. Jones. And uh, Tom Hanks was scheduled to host it. Unfortunately, Tom Hanks is not able to do it. So they asked Jared J.B. Boyd to do it. <laughs> so if you got any frequent flyer miles, I'll see you at the Lincoln Center in Manhattan on July 12th with Booker T. Jones and the Stats Music Academy, sponsored by WYXR 91.7 FM. See y'all in the next studio session. Y'all be good.